Well, greetings to you, and uh, thank you for having me, and I, uh, I only wish I could see Blake and renew my uh, personal fellowship with uh, him again, your pastor. I really have a great respect for, for him and his dedication uh, to the Word of God. This morning, we're going to be looking at John chapters 14 through 16, not the entire passage, but selections uh, out of John chapter 14 uh, through chapter uh, 16. A lot of people know about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They can tell you the facts. And when they think of those facts, however, for some people, they don't necessarily embrace them as truth for their own life. I, I've always wondered, why is it that some can hear the gospel, perhaps even have a mental understanding, but themselves not embrace the truth of the gospel as the key to all of life. I, I ran into this in the various universities that I attended, um, and I was always shocked that perhaps the most intelligent people sometimes were also the most spiritually uh, dead people at the same time. And so intellectual intelligence doesn't necessarily mean gospel understanding. As a matter of fact, you and I cannot understand who Jesus Christ is and what he really means for us apart from the work of God, the Holy Spirit. And so what I'd like us to do today is try to see how the Holy Spirit of God works and who is the Holy Spirit. We rightly focus on, as we sang, and uh, as uh, Blake mentioned, we focus on Jesus Christ, but how is it that you and I can come to know Jesus Christ? This is the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Trinity, wrote a book on the Trinity. Um, still not sure I entirely understand the Trinity, and when I run into people who think they understand the Trinity, I'm pretty sure that they don't. Uh, God is Trinity, and this is beyond our comprehension, and yet it is a truth that we embrace because it is revealed by God. God is Father. God is Son. God is Holy Spirit. Now, when I mention the Holy Spirit in a Baptist church, there is usually a bit of a, of a tremble that runs through the heart because of the charismatic and Pentecostal movements that have often uh, had uh, less uh, than welcome effect among uh, traditional Baptists. I'm a traditional Baptist, and so I hope you will forgive me for bringing up the Holy Spirit. But since the Holy Spirit is God, we need to know who he is. And because he is the God who brings and drives the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ deep into our hearts, we need to know who he is. Because without the Spirit, we do not know Jesus. And moreover, without Jesus, we do not know the Spirit. And without Jesus and the Spirit, we do not come before the Father. Whenever Jesus was preparing uh, to uh, meet the cross from which he would arise and ascend to the right hand of the Father, he left his disciples this farewell discourse, is what scholars call it, in John chapters 14 through 16. And in the middle of it, he discusses the Holy Spirit. Now, he discusses the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. But I want us to focus in on the Holy Spirit. And there are five passages, five short passages, passages within John chapters 14 through 16 that deal with the Holy Spirit. These are called the paraclete sayings. The paraclete is a, uh, it's a Greek word, and it can mean a couple of different things. Uh, and if your translation, I don't know what translation you use, it may have helper, it may have a comforter, uh, it may have assistant, uh, I think, uh, or advocate, um, 
But I think perhaps the best translation is that chosen by the Christian Standard Bible and the Revised Standard Version, and that is counselor. You see, a counselor is somebody who is personally intimate with you, aren't they? If you have somebody that gives you counsel and a wise advice, they're personally close to you. They're intimate with you as a friend would be. But a counselor can also be a lawyer. And in the Roman world, the Greco-Roman world, the paraclete was somebody who was typically a friend of yours, but he would also go to you uh, or go with you to a court and help represent you. This is the role of the Holy Spirit. He is one who comes close and intimate with us, but he is also the one who represents us before the throne room of God. This is the counselor. This is the paraclete. Uh, before we go on and look at the passage, you need to know there is another person in Scripture who is described as the paraclete. If you were to go to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, you would see that Jesus himself is also paraclete. So when you go before the throne room of God, and all of us must go before that throne room for judgment at some point, if you go before the throne room with God, I hope you will go with two counselors, two advocates, because you're in big trouble and you need a lot of legal help before the throne room of God. So you need two lawyers, all right? You need the Son and the Holy Spirit. But let us look at the Holy Spirit. And we'll begin reading in chapter 14 and uh, uh, verse 12. And truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do. And he will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. The Son is leaving and going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it, Jesus says. He goes on. If you love me, you will keep my commands. I've always thought that was an interesting aside. If you love me, you will keep my commands. If you love God, you will keep his commands. How do you know you love God? Do you keep his commands? Hmm. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor. Right here, you have God the Trinity, don't you? The Son is asking the Father to send another counselor. Now, the word here is allos, and it means for many scholars, another of the same kind. Not another of a different kind. That would be a different Greek word, heteros. So, another of the same kind. He will send you another counselor. Another counselor, as Jesus is saying, besides me. Listen to how this other counselor will come and what he will do. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. When this other counselor comes, he doesn't leave. He will be with you forever. Do you remember when the Spirit of God came upon Saul in the Old Testament and then left Saul? Do you remember David prayed, take not your Holy Spirit from me? Let me tell you, when Jesus gives you the Spirit, the Spirit never leaves. He, verse 17, is the Spirit of truth. There are lots of spirits in this world, demonic spirits, spirits of men. And most of them are characterized by what? Lies, deception. If you haven't figured it out yet... This world is full of lies and falsehoods and deceptions. Open the newspaper. Listen to the politician. Listen to some preachers. You will hear lies. This world is full of lies. 
There is one spirit, however, who is truth all the way through. And this is the paraclete. This is the spirit who comes from God. This is the spirit of truth. And as spirit of truth, he brings us truth. Do you know that the spirit of truth inspired the apostles to write this text that you have in front of you? It is a true text. And everything that is revealed in this text is utterly true. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. What is the relationship of the Spirit to God? What is the relationship of the Spirit to believers? What is the relationship of the Spirit to the world? You can tell a lot about a person through their relationships, can't you? Uh, I used to uh, have to read a lot of resumes in the various administrative roles I, I've had in my life. I was once a uh, chief financial officer for a real estate and investment corporation, and I had to read resumes because we were hiring people, and so I'd hire people on the basis of their resumes. Did the same thing when I was an administrator uh, at uh, Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. I hired faculty, I had to read their resumes. And when I read their resumes, it was always amazing to me, I could tell a lot about a person on the basis of their relationships. Where had they lived? Where had they lived for the last five years? That'll tell you a lot about a person. Who is their family? Now, when you look at family, that tells you a great deal about a person. Where did they go to church? How did they function in their roles? Relationships tell us a lot about a person. Relationships, in some ways, define a person. Do you know who I am? Uh, Blake introduced you to me. I'm a professor at the seminary, right? I preach the Word of God. He likes me. That ought to tell you something. <laughs> but do you know who I really am? If you want to know who I really am, you talk to my wife. Because my identity comes from from my relationship with her, which is the closest human relationship I have on this planet. Do you want to know who I really am? You talk to my children. Oh, they'll tell you who I am because they know who I am because they've lived with me for years. And I, by the way, I'm blessed to have all five of my children to have been led by the Spirit of God to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, that's more important to me than anything. I see a lot of children out here if you hear the gospel and the Spirit of God comes on your heart and con convicts you of sin and judgment and righteousness, believe, trust him, you will have life. Oh, it's such a good thing to have children come to the Lord. But you can tell a lot about people through their relationships. What is the relationship of the Spirit to God the Father and to God the Son? What is the relationship of the Spirit of God to believers? What is the relationship of the Spirit of God to the world? Did you notice a curious statement here, the last statement? Look at verse 17 again. The world. What is the relationship of the world to the Spirit? The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. The Spirit of God cannot even be recognized by the world. Because of our sinfulness, we have blinders on us. We cannot even see the Spirit of God. And we cannot understand God or His Son because we lack the Spirit. But what is the relationship of believers to the Spirit? Notice this. But you do know Him. So if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you have been born again by faith, then you know the Spirit. You know the Spirit because He remains with you and will be in you. That's a close relationship, isn't it? If you have a relationship with God, and I mean if you are saved, if you have been born again, if you have converted to Jesus Christ, if you are a believer in Him, then you have the Spirit of God in you and with you forever. Now, I want you to notice, Jesus didn't say, 
if you have this definable experience at this point. It's if you know Jesus, you know the Spirit. That is the basis of having the Spirit, is Jesus Christ. There is no possession of Christ apart from the Spirit. There is no possession of the Spirit apart from Christ. They go hand in hand. They come together. After all, he is Trinity. He is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And if you know one of the persons of the Trinity, guess what? You know them all. <laughs> and moreover, the relationship is close. Jesus says, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to ask the Father, and he's going to send you another counselor. Jesus, where is Jesus right now? Yes, we speak of him being in our hearts, but the reason that he is in our heart, the reason that we can say with Paul that we are in Christ is because the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ is with us. Because bodily right now, this, the body of Jesus Christ is at the throne of God. So he'll be with you and in you. Uh, Look again, if you would, at the next paraclete passage, and you'll get a better idea of who the Spirit is. Verse 25 of chapter 14. I have spoken these things, the gospel, who God the Father is, who God the Son is. He says, I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you. Now, Jesus told the disciples that he would die on the cross and rise from the dead. He gave them the gospel, that he would send to the right hand of the Father, and that one day he would return. He told these things. He said, so I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. Have you ever listened to another person and then forgotten what they said? I, I hear the women laughing about that one. <laughs> My wife will tell me that. Did you, did you, and she'll make me repeat myself to her, tell me what I just said. And of course, you know, I'll have to pull back in my mind and think to myself really quickly for a second and, and I, I'll pull it out and Typically, I'm right, but once in a while, I'm wrong, and she'll say, you weren't listening. We forget things. We're human beings. We forget things, and we and the apostles will forget what Jesus says unless the Spirit of God comes and reminds us. And he reminded the apostles of exactly all that Jesus said, and he inspired them to write down the New Testament. That's why you can trust God's Word, because it is inspired by the Holy Spirit, who takes the perfect Word of the perfect Son of God and imprints it on paper for us. And then this is passed down to us. The Holy Spirit does that, and he reminds us of everything I've told you. This is for primarily the apostles, but it also applies to their teaching, which is contained in Scripture for us. Let's look at the next paraclete saying, the third of them. And this one is going to get a little deep, so put your thinking caps on. Chapter 15, next chapter. Look at verse 26 and 27. When the counselor comes, the one I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. Here we have the Trinity again. Jesus says, when the counselor, that is the Holy Spirit, right? When he comes, he is the one, Jesus says, that I will send to you from the Father. Where does the Spirit come from? From the Father. From the Son. Who sends the Spirit? I, Jesus said, will send the Spirit to you from the Father. And then he gives a further definition I will send to you the Spirit from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. 
If I were to ask you who is the Son of God and what is the relationship of the Son of God to God the Father, you might say, you might quote me John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. That's who Jesus is. He is the only begotten Son. He is the unique Son of God. He is generate from the Father. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, eternally receives from the Father his being. The Son is the eternal Son of the eternal Father, and the Son and the Father have an eternal Holy Spirit. And so the Son's relationship to the Father is one of generation, one of being begotten, one of being a Son. But the Spirit of God is not another Son. What is the relationship of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is God as much as as God the Father and God the Son are God, what is the relationship of the Holy Spirit to God the Father? The only text in Scripture that we have that defines that relationship is this verse right here. And it comes down to just a few words in the Greek, ekperuotai, para tu patru. Proceeds from the Father. In English. What does it mean to proceed? It means that he comes out of. Eternally, God the Father is proceeding the Spirit. Now, this is above and beyond time. When I talk about generation, when I talk about being begotten, you and I think in very human terms. I have generated eight children. Five of ours survived into into being a child. The other three were taken while in the womb. Very sad, but I'm looking forward to the day that I will meet them in glory. But you and I think of time, but well, yes, these children are generated. What is the relationship of God the Son to God the Father? He is eternally generated, not in a fleshly way, for God is spirit. But eternally, God is continually giving himself to the Son. So the Son's being is from the Father's being. It is the eternal generation of the Son. What is the eternal relationship of the Spirit to God? He eternally proceeds from the Father. So the Spirit eternally receives his divine being from the Father. We don't worship three gods. We worship one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Son is eternally generate from the Father. God the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father. That is why I said put on your thinking cap. That's beyond our ability to understand because it's happening eternally. And you and I exist in time. And it, we have a hard time thinking about what happened yesterday, much less thinking about what happened all yesterdays, all todays, and all tomorrows, and more beyond that. Yes, this is the eternal relationship of the Spirit to the Father and the Son. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God eternally. This is the truth. This is what separates Christians. You know, Christians like Baptists and Catholics, yes, and Eastern Orthodox and Methodists and Presbyterians. This is what separates them from non-Christians, like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. There really is a difference, and it comes down to these truths. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God, three beings, or three persons. And in the Greek, sometimes that means beings as well. One God, three persons, and they share the deity. Another way to say it is in English, the three is one God. Or the one God are three persons. We just butchered the English language, didn't we? But divine truth is far beyond the human mind's capability to comprehend these truths. Let's move on to the fourth 
of the paraclete sayings. Notice here in chapter 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. So the son in his flesh dies on the cross, arises from the dead, ascends to the right hand of the Father, and then sends the Holy Spirit. And of course, we know that the Spirit, according to Acts chapter 2, came at Pentecost, right? I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will do three things with regard to the world. What is the relationship of the Spirit to the world? There is no relationship that the world knows until the Spirit comes to do these three things. Listen to the three things that the Spirit does. He convicts the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. He convicts the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. This is the relationship of the Spirit of God to the world. The relationship of the Spirit of God to the world is a legal relationship. He is still the counselor, but now he's not the counselor that comes with the person that is in the dock being examined. He is the one that shines the light and exposes the sin of the one who is being examined. If you don't have the Spirit of God in you and with you because of faith in Jesus Christ, then you will be convicted before the eternal throne of God. And this is what the Spirit does. Even now, he is convicting the world of sin. And notice, if you will, what is the sin, the overarching sin of all sins. He defines it here. He will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me. Most of us think of sins in the plural, don't we? You do this or you don't do that. You do something that you know you shouldn't do. That is sin, yes. Or you don't do something that you know you should have done. That is sin. These are sins. But what is the root sin that convicts us of judgment before the throne of God? Not believing in Jesus Christ. This is the sin of all sins. When you are confronted with who Jesus Christ is and the Spirit of God is driving that truth into your heart and you say, no, that is is the unforgivable sin. That is what brings people to eternal judgment. Yes, there are sins. Don't do those things. <laughs> but the ultimate sin is not believing in Jesus Christ. This is sin, Jesus says. What is righteousness? About righteousness, in verse 10, because I am going to the Father and you will no longer see me. What is righteousness? Well, actually, the better question is, who is righteousness? Jesus Christ is the righteous one. Jesus never sinned. Jesus obeyed the Father perfectly while on this earth. Jesus died on a cross for our sins, and yet he himself had no sin. Jesus Christ rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father. If you want to be right before the divine court, the only way you can be right is to be one with Jesus Christ, is to have him as your savior, to believe in him, to be united with him by the Holy Spirit. That's the righteousness. What's the third thing the Spirit convicts or exposes? Judgment, verse 11, and about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. There are two kingdoms that are vying for supremacy in the universe, in creation. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of God the Father 
and the Son and the Holy Spirit against the kingdom of the devil and the evil angels. And it is a huge battle. And that battle is throughout the world and it's in every single human heart. This battle has to be decided at the level of the human heart. The question is, where are you? You are either in one kingdom or another. There is no fence sitting here. There's no dual citizenship. My son was born in England. He could have been an English citizen. He opted for American citizenship. There's one or the other. That was the law. The same law applies to this creation. You're either in the kingdom of heaven or you're in the kingdom of hell. You're either in the, under the domain, the sovereignty of the devil, or you are under the domain, the sovereignty of God. And only Jesus Christ can take you and me, bec- who because of our sin, we are in the kingdom of this world, in the kingdom of hell, bound to hell, bound to judgment, Only Jesus Christ can take us and move us from one to another. And he did that by dying on the cross and rising from the dead. So that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But how is it that you and I can come to believe? This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Convicting us of the coming judgment. And that our only hope is to trust in Jesus Christ to take away our sins. The final paraclete saying, Jesus says, I have so many things to tell you. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. I saw a movie one time, uh, and uh, one actor was telling another to tell the truth, and the, the other actor came back and said, you can't handle the truth. It was that Jack Nicholson and... Tom, somebody or another. (laughs) You and I can't handle the entire truth of the word of God. The disciples couldn't handle it. In this life, God gave me a pretty big brain. I can't handle all of his truth. I'm still digging in his word and finding out I can't get all of it. And sometimes I forget. The disciples couldn't handle the truth. They couldn't bear it. But the Spirit of God can bring you that truth and help you to understand and to see. You can't bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. The Spirit tells you the past and his focus is on the Son of God. That's how you can tell where the Spirit of God is. If somebody is talking about the Spirit of God, but their emphasis is on themselves, you know that's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God puts the emphasis on Jesus Christ. He will glorify me, Jesus says. He, the Spirit, will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. Mine. What are the first three words that a baby learns? Data. Typically, that's for just just saying. (laughs) Mama and mine, or no. What what they mean by no is mine, right? (laughs) What does that word mean, mine? It means of me. This belongs to me. The Spirit has control over everything that belongs to Jesus, right? He takes what is of mine. Jesus says that everything that the Father possesses is what? Mine. If Jesus, who is the Son of God, and God the Father and God the Son own what is mine, that ought to tell you that they have everything equally, which is again another indication of the unity of the Father and the Son And the Holy Spirit. I told you you had to put on your thinking caps. 
The Spirit of God is so much bigger than we are. The Son of God is so much bigger than what we are. But the Son of God, the Spirit of God, come from God the Father to convict us of our sin and of the righteousness that is available in Jesus Christ and of the coming judgment that each one of us must prepare for. Are you prepared?